My name is Mika Poutola and this is Speed Skating Secrets. You know, this is more of a lifestyle, you know, like, it's like health beyond skating. Like, to have the discipline and the structure to kind of reevaluate and break those habits that you formed, that you become so comfortable with, it's, it's, it's more of a lifestyle change now. So enjoy and learn. Welcome. One of my favorite skaters ever is today on this show. I got, I got to know this guy more than 15 years ago. He has won four Olympic medals and more than 20 world championship medals. He's also world record holder for 1000 meter and 1500 meter. Even though he's more than 10 centimeters taller than me, at one point we used to wear same size clothes. One of the happiest and well-known skater in the world. Thank you for coming to the show, Shani Davis. Hey, thanks for having me, Miko. Yeah, it's really cool. We've been training together for a while now, and uh, it's good to good to get to know you a little bit better. Yeah, it's cool. Okay, let's start this podcast. So, how did you find speed skating in the first place? I used to roller skate when I was a kid, around two years old with my mom. And uh, she was looking for something that we can do together, like mother-son activities on the weekends. And we took lessons to kind of do like roller dance skating. But I wasn't really interested in the, in the dance part of skating. I was more interested in the speed part of skating. And a lot of the people recommended speed skating to us. But it was a sport that we were never, we never, we weren't familiar with. We never heard of speed skating. And then the, and, uh, the rollerblade skating came out. It became very popular at the roller rinks. And then out of, um, really funny, my mom used to work for a guy that had a son that did speed skating and she was a secretary. And she was filing papers for him and she saw some sp- papers about speed skating. And then she asked him about speed skating and he told her that I should try speed skating. And this is when I was around six years old. And then I tried it and I stayed with it ever since. Oh, nice. So, who has been the most influencer guy in your uh, like skating career when you think about you as a younger speed skater? I would say the people at my club were the people I looked up to the most. I wasn't familiar with like the Olympic champions and world champions of speed skating. I didn't even know that I didn't know anything about Olympic skating or world championship skating. I, I was more familiar with what I saw in front of me things that I could identify with. There was a lot of kids that were African-American like me, and I looked up to them and I admired them because uh, I saw myself being like them, growing up being like them. And uh, the people that I admire still to this day in, in speed skating would be them. Mm-hmm. So did you had a coach when you were that young or how did you start? We had a coach. It was a, a, just a local coach. He would come out to the ice rink and he would coach many of the, um, the kids there. And he didn't really specialize or really know about, I don't believe, like world level, world class skating. It was just more like recreation. Yeah, I have actually the same experience. My coach, when I was younger, he was like, he didn't care if, if we like became like professional skater or anything. He just wanted us to have fun and enjoy skating. Yeah, that's right. That's that's the way it was for us. We just had fun. It was like like a playground on ice. We just went out there and we played. We played tag. We played catch. We played uh, ca- catch the bacon, all kind of uh, silly games. But uh, it was just more fun. <laughs> that sounds good. Yeah. So, have you had many coaches in your career, and what did you learn from them? Um, yeah, I, I probably had the most coaches out of almost any skater. Um, it was nice to be able to work with so many different coaches because I've learned a little bit from all of the coaches, and then I just kind of applied what I like most from each one of those coaches and put it in. I incorporated it into my own style of skating. So I was really lucky to be able to come up and live in Canada and learn from the Canadians and then have uh, some short track coaches from Canada, had some short track coaches from Korea, had some long track coaches from Korea, some, just a little bit. I worked with the Dutch. I mean, I've worked with almost everybody and I just kind of take a little bit of the things that I like and the things I don't like, I just kind of don't do anymore. But uh, I put it all together. I made my unique style of skating. Yeah. And you have also been training a lot by yourself. Why is that? I just felt like um, 
I was very successful in the like mid 2000s, 2005, 2006, 2007 when I had a group. But then there was a lot of these um, people like people came into the organization and made rules that international skaters could not train with national team skaters. And I remember paying a lot of money and um, thinking like they're stopping me from training with a group and the things that they taught me, I, I already know, like I learned enough from them whereas I could do the things that they taught me on my own. So why am I paying these people all this money just to be told who I can and cannot train with? I'd rather just save my money and train on my own. And that's yeah. what I did. Do you enjoy training alone? I like having the freedom of being on my own. It's a lot of responsibility and sometimes you need a partner to kind of like help push you because there's certain days where you just don't feel up to like doing the work, you're not motivated. But uh, some other days, it's nice to be able to sleep in and be more accountable for your own schedule and not have to worry about holding people back or being on time for other people. So it's pluses and minuses for both aspects of that. But um, I enjoyed being on my own, but I, more than anything now, since I'm older, I enjoy having a group of people to train with. It's a lot of fun to have that. Yeah. Well, I also know that you you have been doing a lot of short tracking. How big of a role short track still like is in your training? It's huge. All summer to summer, um, I trained in uh, Korea skating short track with a good group of kids. Um, I was by far the oldest. <laughs> And I was training with uh, people from like high school and grammar school. And these kids, uh, their skill level of skating is just unbelievable how strong they are, how dedicated they are, how passionate they are about their skating and training, how seriously they would take it. It was so refreshing to have, uh, to be able to be challenged like that because I have a lot of pride since I'm older. So uh, it took me a while to kind of get on par with what they were doing. But once I was able to get myself into shape, I was able to hold my own. But um, short track is very important because it's my grassroots, it's something I grew up doing. And for any skater, I always recommend sticking to your roots and not going too far away from home because you have to stay true to what makes you uniquely you. Yeah, well, that's good. Uh, let's dive a little bit into your habits that you are having. Do you have some kind of like morning rituals that you think is important for an athlete? Not necessarily. I think now the main thing is when I wake up, um, I try to get a decent breakfast, nothing too crazy. Just like, I try to get good nutrition. And uh, if I feel sleepy, I sleep in, I'm a procrastinator. I wait to the last minute to do everything. So if I wake up at a certain time and I feel still tired, I'll always just try to <laughs> get that extra rest, get that extra sleep. Those extra few minutes really help sometimes, but, um, For the most part, I'm not too strict on my, my routine. I just make sure that I feel I'm awake and I, I make sure that I have good energy going to practice. I try not to come to practice a slouching, feeling down, feeling out of it. I try to really work that out in the morning before I come to my training environment, to my work. Yeah. Uh, if we think about your diet overall, do you have a like, strict diet or not so much? This season is actually something, that's something I've been playing around with. Um, normally, when I was younger, I had a very fast metabolism, so I could get away with eating whatever I wanted, and it wouldn't really affect me to, you know, like, it wouldn't affect my weight so much. I feel like now that I'm older, um, and I started this this summer, um, I started watching the amount of junk that I would eat, a lot of the sugars and the drinks, and I started cutting a lot of, like, the carbs, like more so like the bread and the, the things that just kind of fill you up, things that are kind of hard to burn off. And I actually lost a significant amount of weight. And um, normally, let's say I weigh about 195 during the season. And at my prime, when I was at my best, I weighed 185. And say now I weigh about 185 again. So I lost probably like 10 pounds, 12 pounds to give, give or take, you know. But it started from just being more conscious, being more aware of like what I'm putting in my body and not having that being too relaxed and just eating what I want to eat. I have a cheat day, like once a week I'll have something that I really enjoy. 
but I try not to overindulge in those things anymore. Now when you've uh, lost that 10 pounds, what you just told us, does it give you something else? And also being strict on your diet, does it give you something else, for example, confidence or something? Uh, I don't think it gives me confidence, but it's just, you know, this is more of a lifestyle, you know? Like, it's like health beyond skating. Like, to have the discipline and the structure to kind of reevaluate and break those habits that you formed, that you become so comfortable with, it's, it's, it's more of a lifestyle change now. Like, I'm really keen on, like, cooking my own meals. I don't like going out that much and eating out. And I also think that helps with uh, my diet because I, I have more control over what goes in, into me, like when I'm feeding myself. Whereas sometimes when you go out and you eat, the food is, you know, more delicious, but you don't have control over it. Like the menu is this, you know, it's very, uh, it's very limited, I would say. But um, It just feels good. More than anything, it feels good knowing that I can, at my age, I can kind of make this change. Yeah, yeah that sounds really good. Uh, you're also coaching a few skaters. Why do you do that now? Well, I, I was coaching a few skaters. Last year I was coaching a Japanese team. Um, it was a way of uh, income for the most part, but also I'm really passionate about coaching. I feel like I have a lot to offer in terms of like technique. I can see skaters skating and I can really pick up and see a lot of things and I understand skating. I feel I have a really good sense of um, of like how things feel on the ice and I can kind of see what other skaters are doing and I can kind of pinpoint some in inaccuracies and what not, what may have you. And um, I really enjoyed coaching and I would like to continue to coach as well, but um, this year was more important for me to focus on me And I still help a few skaters if they have questions for me. I always have time to sit down and talk with them and try to address certain problems or concerns they may have. But this year is too important for me to really not have all the focus on me. So it wouldn't have been fair if I had a coaching job this year, Olympic year. Is that something that you, you want to pursue when you quit skating someday? It depends where what where opportunity lies um i would love to coach it just depends on kind of where and like again like the financials and stuff but um i'm open to the idea because i feel like i can help a lot of people yeah is there any anything that you think that you made differently because you're so successful in space skating that a lot of other like professional skaters haven't done uh, um Or what, what made you so good? I think what made me so good is because the environment that I grew up in, it installed in me certain life qualities, life habits, and things weren't just handed to me. I always had to do double the amount of what the other person did to get the same thing that they got. And I had a lot of criticism. So my, a lot of my success comes from things around me being negative and me trying to prove those people wrong. And I always had something more than just, um, when I was skating, something more to give to people that believed in me. Because I always wanted to make sure if someone believed in me, I didn't let them down. So I would just go that extra mile, that I would just do that extra so that I didn't feel guilty about people investing time, energy, money, effort into me. I didn't want that to be in vain. So. One, some of my biggest things that I'm happy about is that I was able to become like world champion, Olympic champion before some of my uh, people that are in my life passed away and they were able to see me at my best and believe in me since the day one. So once I was able to like achieve that, like the rest of it's kind of a bonus, but that was like my motivation because uh, there are certain days I would look at skating and being in the position I was in then, I would have never thought that now I would be where I'm at now in terms of like my accomplishments. So I'm really proud that I was able to do that f for them. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's really interesting. Like you you really get power, like kind of like show people that they were wrong, but also you really want to step up for those guys who believed in you. Exactly. It's, it's about them because they didn't have to invest the time, energy and money into me. They could have done that and did other things for themselves, but they chose to believe in me and 
sponsor and support me. So when they did that, I just made sure that I didn't let them down. I tried my best, even though sometimes people try their best and um, they don't get the results. They still, you know, it's all about just trying your best and being the best you can. And again, if the results are there at the end of the day, that's great. But if not, then you still did the best you can. You got to be able to live with that too. Yeah. Well, um, I hope there's a lot of like um, junior skaters that are listening to this. Is there some advice that you would give to yourself when you were 15? That something that you know now, but you didn't know then? Well, when I was younger, This is really interesting. It's a good question you asked, Mika, because when I was a junior, I wasn't the best skater. I remember seeing the best juniors. I, I remember seeing um, Johan Reuler, Shingo Doi, a num numerous amounts of uh, Korean skaters, Japanese skaters, um, Bjorn Ninehouse, uh, um, tons of really talented junior skaters. I was always in the mix, but I was never the best. And I remember one day, And this is what goes back to people believing in you. I remember at, at, after a country match once, I was really disappointed in my performance. And my coach pulled me aside and told me, like, Shani, you know that if you ever focused on long track skating, you could be the best skater. You can be the best ever. And I looked at him and I'm thinking, like, you know, I don't know how much of this to believe because maybe he's just saying this to, like, make me feel better about myself. But I really took that to heart. And then when I would focus on my skating, I always thought about how he felt about me and it, it meant the world to me that he thought that I could be so good because a lot of people didn't. And little by little, I just kept on believing and I just kept on working hard towards that, you know, becoming the best that I could be, not being better than other people, but just being the best that I could be. And, uh, you know, with time, I got stronger. I got a more of an understanding about long track skating and, um, I was able to become very strong, very good at it. But I don't know if I would have ever had the courage to even try that if I didn't have the right people, like I told you, believing in me. Because when people believe in me, since so many people were negative against me when I was younger coming up in the sport of skating, it motivated me. And to have someone come out, go out of their way to tell me that you can be really good, you can be the best, it just meant the world to me. Ryan told me that, Ryan Shimabukuro told me that. And that was like in 2000, 2002, 2000, 2002, I believe, or maybe even 2000, yeah, two, 2000, 2001. That's when he told me that. <laughs> and then, of course, you know, like my mom, like my biggest supporter ever, I remember she told me that I could be the best once. And I'm thinking, mom, you're just saying that because you're my mom. Yeah. Like, you're, you know, that's what a parent's supposed to tell their child. But she thought I could be better than Olympic and world champions. And I just thought that she was, you know, just, you know, thinking like any any parent that loves their child is going to tell their child that. Right. But uh, she saw something and she believed in something. And that also motivated me. And then this, to actually go out and be able to beat Olympic champions and world champions when after they told me that was just. And then what Ryan told me, it just really started to like formulate for myself that I could really do it. And then once I started believing, you build up your confidence. You're not as afraid to go out there and, and do things and go for things that you would have went for if you didn't have the confidence and you didn't believe in yourself. So everything kind of happened at, for, at the right time, at the right place for me. Yeah. So do you think that uh, one of the, like, the most important qualities of a coach is that he's actually believing in his athletes and he's also kind of giving the confidence for the athletes. I, I do, but at the, you got to be careful with that though because um, the coach has to be honest. You know, you can't tell that to just any skater. You have to really see something in the skater that they have potential and talent. And then you have, it's your job as a coach, you know, or the coach's job to really know how to like deliver that message because some people might be over pressured to or feel too much anxiety to want to have to perform if a coach is trying to build them up too much so i i like it now when the coach doesn't really tell me much i hate when someone's too much in my face trying to like pump me up and build me up when i'm <laughs> you know like i know what i need to do i don't need anyone to build up my confidence. You know, I'm really honest skater. Like if I skate and I feel a certain way, then I kind of know if I can do it or I can't do it. 
but nothing's worse than someone coming up to you telling you something that you don't feel. Yeah. And uh, the coaches that I've been around when I was younger thankfully didn't do that. As I got older, <laughs> there's been some coaches telling me certain things that I could do certain things and I would feel exactly opposite of that. And then it just wouldn't go as well as it would have went if they just would have given me my space and let me come to that feeling or conclusion on my own. So it's a very thin line, fine line, I would say a coach has to ride in order to be able to communicate with their skater. But I think the biggest thing is honest, being honest and the athlete being honest with himself, knowing himself. And the coach has to help the athlete know, learn themselves, know themselves so that they know what they're capable of doing and being able to do those things and work towards doing those things. Thank you so much, Shani. So where can people find you in social media if they want to contact you? I don't really do social media that much. I think I have a Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, like my publicist and stuff does that stuff. I can't stand social media, man. I, I just want to play video games and train and, <laughs> and cook. <laughs> But uh, my website, uh, shinydavis.org, I think there's like a link there to like my social media stuff. If people want to reach out and talk to me, I'm usually pretty open. I communicate with people that write me. People have written me before personally on email or written me on my uh, Team Shawnee Davis account. And I always try my best to get back to those people because if there's something that I could do to help them, I always wanted someone to help me when I was younger if I ever needed like help or, or things, questions. But since they didn't do that when I was younger, people didn't really reach out to help me. I made sure that when I, as I got older, I promised myself I would never turn my back on someone that needed help and I felt that I can help them. So I'm very easy to find and um, I'm very approachable. So if people ever have anything they want from me, I'm more than open to trying to help them or communicate with them the best I can. Thank you so much. And uh, I wish you good luck for this season. Thank you, Mika, you as well. So one more thing before you go. Please share it with your friends and leave a review wherever you listen.